So now that we've looked at the fertilization events that occur within the sea urchin's fertilization structure, we're going to now switch gears and look at mammal fertilization. And that's what we'll entitle this next flowchart. Mammal fertilization. Now it's important to recognize that you and I are mammals and thus we will follow this fertilization pathway that we'll highlight. Now, before we get into the actual steps associated with mammal fertilization, let's first do a little bit of background information on the process so that we have a good grounding of where we're at. Just like we did for sea urchin fertilization, it's important to understand structure, specifically the structure of the ovum or egg. So we'll in put this as the subtitle of egg structure. So here what we're going to do is the same thing. We're going to go from the inside of the egg to the outside of the egg. The several coverings that we see are of course dependent on the species and mammals themselves are a broad group of organisms that have many species within them that all have the following egg structure. Their structure contains a plasma membrane as the innermost membrane, as the innermost covering. Later on it's going to then have another covering over it called the zona pellucida. So here's our first difference between sea urchin and mammal fertilization in terms of egg structure. What did we have in the sea urchin fertilization? Here was the vitamin layer, that was the thin layer. Here it's called the zona pellucida. And then outside the zona pellucida is another layer. It's another covering called follicle cells. So the egg when it ovulates, when it leaves as a secondary oocyte, if you remember, it's going to have a bit of the follicle cells that it left. Some of them will actually stay on it. The zona pellucida will be next, and then innermost would be the plasma membrane. So what you have to imagine is sperm cell comes through the oviduct, finds the egg. It has to go through the follicle cells, go through the zona pellucida, and then finally undergo plasmogamy with this plasma membrane. So we still have three layers, it's just that the layers have different names here. And also I think the most important difference to recognize is that mammals do not have external fertilization. They instead, of course, have the only other option, which would be internal fertilization. Things are going to happen. These fertilization events that we'll highlight in just a second are going to happen on the inside of the mammal. So this is the same for humans as it is for cats, as it is for dogs, as it is for whales, whatever it may be. So this internal fertilization is critical because this is what the whole point of the production of sperm and the delivery of sperm and, and the production of an egg and the uh, retrieval of the sperm and fertilization of egg is all going to occur on the inside. That's why we focus so much on the internal anatomy of both the male and female reproductive system, so it's worthy of appreciating and understanding that this is an internal process. So let's take a look at the steps of mammal fertilization. So as we go through these steps, much like I did here with the background information, be able to compare and contrast mammal fertilization with sea urchin fertilization. Those are often exam-heavy questions that ask you to compare on different levels the differences and also similarities between both types of fertilization events. So what we're going to start with in the steps here is the acrosomal reaction. We're going to start with this right here. So we're going to assume that the sperm has been delivered, it has been ejaculated, it has been delivered to the female reproductive tract, it is within the oviduct, it reaches the egg, and now what's going to happen? What's going to happen is the acrosomal reaction. So that's a similarity. The same reaction happened within sea urchin fertilization. Here we're going to have a bit of a difference though. The acrosomal reaction is sort of a, a response to when the sperm, and we should understand this, binds to a molecule known as ZP3. The sperm binds to ZP3. This is a glycoprotein. And remember what glycoproteins are useful for. Glycoproteins are always involved in recognition. So ZP3 is a glycoprotein receptor. And this is going to be a receptor specifically on, what do you think? ZP probably stands for zona pellucida, and that's exactly what it stands for. So this is on the ZP. So what's going to happen here is that you have to have this binding onto the ZP3. But now you might be wondering, wait, what about the follicle cells on the outside? Well, what's going to happen is the sperm will easily be able to get through the follicle cells because it's just a cellular structure, and it's not too hard to sort of wiggle your way through these. But when you get to the zona pellucida, it's a little bit harder. It's more of a structural component, more of a structured covering that's on the egg, and that's where we're going to have our initial acrosomal reaction begin. So that's what we're going to do next. 
So upon this recognition, lock and key, sperm receptor binds to egg receptor. Specifically, remember the receptor is known as ZP3. This is going to trigger everything henceforth. So now what we're going to see is the acrosome go into action. The acrosome, remember, it's that structure at the tip of the sperm head. It bursts. If the acrosome bursts, that means whatever within it releases itself. And what's within an acrosome? Hydrolytic enzymes. So acrosome bursts. This releases those hydrolytic enzymes. What are hydrolytic enzymes good for? These are digesting enzymes. They digest through whatever structure is in front of them. And the structure right now is the zona pellucida. So they digest through the ZP, zona pellucida. This is all in hopes of in undergoing a plasmogamy event. Now, so once we have this acrosomal burst and this digestion through ZP and we get this recognition, what's next? What's next is we have to prevent something. We have to prevent, even in mammals, just like sea urchins, we have to prevent polyspermy. This is a big idea in all of fertilization. We want to make sure only one sperm fertilizes one egg and that's it. So how do we do this? This is going to trigger the prevention, preventive mechanisms to polyspermy, this second step. But what I want to first sort of highlight is that in mammals, there's actually no fast block. There's no fast block in mammals. Okay, That's the first thing I want to put on the, on the onset. So let's keep that in mind. So that would mean what would be the primary way mammal fertilization prevents polyspermy. There is going to be a slow block, and that's the sort of step that's next. Here what we're going to highlight is that a slow block to polyspermy, so this is the slow block to polyspermy, is going to occur via the process, same process, and that's going to be via the mechanism that is known as a cortical reaction. So remember, a cortical reaction involves a signal transduction pathway. That signal transduction pathway, upon recognition of sperm and egg receptors, is going to trigger calcium. What about calcium? Calcium, which is a positive ion, is going to be released as a secondary messenger in this signal transduction pathway into the cytoplasm. Where is it coming from? If you remember, calcium is always stored in the ER, so I don't want to reiterate that. I just want to make sure you remember it, okay? So calcium is released into the cytoplasm. This, of course, then creates granules. That's sort of the secondary response to the secondary message of this signal transduction pathway. We create cortical granules. So remember, cortical granules have stuff within them. So let's do what we need to do with the, that stuff. The whole purpose of these granules is to take them to the outer portion right now of the egg. And right now the focus is the zona pellucida. That's sort of our outer portion. And what we're going to do is release the granule contents. That's next. Once we've made the granules, let's release the contents at the right spot. That's critical here. So we're going to release contents. Remember, that's like enzymes, macromolecules, etc. And these contents will be released at the zona pellucida. Okay? This is going to then cause our sort of structural changes within the egg. Specifically, the zona pellucida undergoes some major events of change. In order to do what? In order to prevent polyspermy, in order to ensure intraspecific uh, fertilization, and in order to prevent interspecific fertilization, whatever it may be, we just want one sperm to fertilize one egg. We've already got a sperm that has completed the job of lock and key. Now it's time to prevent anything else besides that sperm from plasmogamy or karyogamy, whatever it may be. So what are the changes that we do to prevent all this? What's the preventive me measures? Well, first of all, as a result of this release of contents, the zona pellucida hardens. These contents are going to structurally change the zona pellucida to make it hard. Why is it that difficult? Why is that necessary? Well, that means no sperm, no matter how many hydrolytic enzymes it has, can digest through this very hard, now, change the zona pellucida structure. In addition, the sperm receptors, remember, ZP3 was the receptor on the zona pellucida that the sperm receptor fit into and allowed for this process to all go downstream. Now, those sperm receptors are spread throughout the zona pellucida, all over the zona pellucida. What's going to happen to them? They're not destroyed, they're not degraded, as in the sea urchin's example, but here the sperm receptors, I will say, are altered. They're changed chemically and structurally to simply prevent binding. 
So we're not going to go all out and destroy them and degrade them with the enzymes. We'll just alter their structure with the enzy enzymatic qualities that are from the contents within the zone, within the cortical granules that we released. And then also another thing to highlight is that we're not going to create a fertilization envelope. In mammals, there is no fertilization envelope formation. Instead, we have this hardened zona pellucida that does more than the job and makes sure that polyspermy does not happen. All of these steps of mammal fertilization are summarized nicely in figure 47.5. Take a look at that, run through it with the figure side by side, and make sure you're able to highlight the differences and similarities in mammal fertilization and sea urchin fertilization. In the next video, we're going to now move forward after these changes have happened, after polyspermy has been prevented. What's next? What does fertilization then have to do? And that's what we'll look at in the next couple of videos.